month it is and which season it seems to be at the moment. So we're, we're uh, our spring is usually your autumn. Our, your autumn is our spring, your winter, summer, and vice versa. So we're fast entering the months that if we had been at home, we'd be entering into those times when people are starting to get ready to have lots of marriages, lots of weddings, summer months, right? Uh, and I've got to thinking about that, of course, and it fits with our topic today. Um, after a person enters into marriage, their life begins to change very dramatically, doesn't it? Some of you who are married know this. <laughs> uh, and that's true both for the man and it's true for the woman. And I could spend time talking about both of those. But I want to talk this morning just about the women's side of it. That's a little strange, isn't it? But I would talk about the, the woman's side of it. But I'm doing so from the scriptural perspective. Uh, it's true since the picture of marriage in the scripture between God and Christ with his church, uh, the church is the one who is from the woman's side of, the, of that in, in this picture of marriage. Uh, I'd like to talk about that from this perspective. Remarkable changes that take place when one enters into marriage. And I'm going to talk about that from the woman's side. So apart from the fact that a woman, when she becomes married, has to start checking the box that says married instead of single, she has, actually has to start living as married, not single. There's a dramatic thing that has to happen there. She begins to have to do things where she has to yield some things that were sort of independent to her. She was an independent character by herself. She yields up some of that independence and now takes into consideration at all points this one she's connected to. She receives a new identity. In most cultures, she gets a new name. Uh, she now yields all that was independently hers in terms of maybe she has some possessions and resources that were hers independently. Now that's something she shares with her husband. Her finances, her time, the Bible says even her body, remarkably, is something that doesn't belong only to her anymore. It belongs to him as well. She must now be willing to adopt a new circle of friends often and share friendships with people that were foreign to her prior to that. She now submits, in many ways, her will to his, hoping that he will reciprocate. Well, again, in this picture that the scripture uses of marriage between the church and Christ, the church is united in covenant with her Savior, Jesus Christ. And in that relationship, believers no longer can act as if they were independent of him. They're not independent of him. They are married to him. They submit to him in everything. They, they view everything differently their finances their relationships their work all the things that they have in life everything so as we've been going through john particularly and now have come to that point of jesus actual crucifixion uh, it's good for us to see that christ is what he's doing from the what i call a whole bible perspective and isaiah helps us with some of that perspective this morning the prophet isaiah addressed god's people in his day which was the old testament church the bride in the Old Testament, if you will, uh, in terms of uh, that which uh, both gave a deep expression of the Redeemer's love for the church. Also his guidance for them as they lived in, in a relationship, in that covenant with him. And that word came to them in a time when they needed encouragement. And as they were made keenly aware of their fallenness, of their falling short of everything that the Lord had called them to, in the covenant, in the law, and anticipated going into exile. These people of, of Israel were about to go into exile. Uh, together with all the hardships associated with that, they needed to hear this good news. But I want us to see this morning how the bridegroom's sacrifice for his bride, and again, that's the John 19 portion, how this bridegroom who comes to love his church sacrifices for his bride, and that broadens our understanding this morning of this redemption that we have in Christ. Now, we could easily do that theoretically. We could think about all those things that Jesus did to his people, the church, and, and think of that at a covenantal sort of uh, academic level. But I hope that in, as we are here to worship God, which is a heart reaction to God, that we will hear the message of what he's doing and not just say them, the church, but me, the church. He's, he's doing this, this loving act, this great service. He's doing it for me. So let's read this portion of scripture now from Isaiah chapter 62. I'll read the first, well, it's all the whole chapter. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. 
The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name, and the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called, my delight is in her, and your land married, for the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I've set watchmen all the day and all the night. They shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it a praise in the earth. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by his mighty arm, I will not give away, give your grain to be food for your enemies. And foreigners shall not drink your wine for which you have labored, but those who garner it shall eat it. And praise the Lord. And those who gather it shall drink it in the courts of my sanctuary. Go through. Go, go through the gates. Prepare the way for the people. Build up. Build up the highway. Clear it of stones. Lift up a signal over the peoples. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth. Say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And they shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you shall be called sought out, a city not forsaken. Start to hear uh, Isaiah agreeing with the things that were said in Hosea. And you begin to hear that all looking forward to the day when Christ will come and he will live on this earth and he will live a life that is perfect and established a righteousness in obedience to the law. And then he will suffer and die and grant to his people in that death redemption. So there's several assertions that are made here with regard to the bride of Christ in this passage. And the first one of them that you should hear about your savior, your groom, if I can call it that, is that you have a zealous savior. The bride of Christ has a zealous savior. And you see that in a particular demonstration. He's zealous for something particular that he's described both in Hosea and he describes it here in Isaiah as well. And that is for your beautification. <laughs> By that, I mean, he, he sees, he's going to see to it that you are made to be beautiful in his righteousness. Again, and this assertion is made in the face of this, condition of his people. They're terrible, unending, it seems, unfaithfulness. They keep falling. They keep going astray from him. And yet he is committed to her to make her spotless. He is committed to make her without blemish. Now, see how I keep doing? I keep saying her as if we were talking about somebody else. But he's talking about you. And that's good news. He's committed to you to make you beautiful. He's committed to you to make you righteous without blemish. That, that church that is, is, of which you're a part is to function as a, a crown of beauty in his hand. And he's going to see that you shine as a demonstration of his glorious work in you to the nations. Uh, that sounds like it's not just at the end when you're going to be glorified, but he's doing that even now as you're living on this earth to glorify you such that he gets glory from you. That's the first thing. You have a zealous savior to see this done and he will see it through. But let's think about the second thing. And that is that like a bride, you'll notice throughout the passage, he talks about giving you a new name. You're going to be called by a new name. Because uh, you're in this covenant relationship with him, you no longer go by your former identity. Just as a bride takes on a new a name and identity there in some ways, uh, this is true in that situation. And the analogy of a bride receiving a new name kind of falls apart at some points. It stumbles, at least for now, in this passage, the new name is a reference to not so much a new person, but a new relationship within the same covenant relationship that they've already had. Uh, it's, it's the same marriage covenant. That is to say, Judah was already married to, to, to God, right? 
to by covenant when Judah came into existence at the time of Abraham. But just as Jeremiah speaks of a new covenant, you hear about that in chapters 31 and so on. Uh, and that's not referring to a new relationship of, of sorts. It's not an abolition of the old covenant. It's rather a development, an exp a new expression of this covenant relationship. So here, the relationship between God and Judah is not being abandoned. It's rather it's being it's growing into a new and better relationship. Uh, a decisive action of the bridegroom is bringing this about. He's zealous for this. And this is the meaning behind the new name that he gives. In the relationship up to this point, Judah has repeatedly been unfaithful. They suffer over and over again. This distance relationally with God, they alienate themselves from God, as it were, but by the decisive action of the groom, the bride uh, is going to be called by a new name. And after all, his great zeal for her righteousness will bring about this transformation in her. It's a restoration of the relationship, not a different relationship. So this original people of God, known as the children of Israel, are now by this point in history uh, so scattered. Uh, they are so fallen apart. And the nation of Israel almost doesn't exist anymore. They're, they're going off into exile in all kinds of different directions. But Judah is in a similar condition. They've had a syncretistic kind of view of their faith. Yeah, they worship the living God, Jehovah, but they've also mixed into that some of the religions of the world, some of the Baals and the other things there. Uh, they've done this politically. They've done it religiously. It's made it hard to distinguish them from the rest of the world. This is what Calvin says about this, uh, this exile, this period of exile that is about to happen for them. He says, as there was no face of a church for 40 years, and although the Lord had some seed, yet it was in a state so disordered and so ruinous that there was no visible people of God. He now restores to the church its name when he has assembled it by the word of the gospel. He's drawing those people to himself now and reestablishing that covenant. All the indications to the people of Judah were that she has been forsaken. You think about that as they head off to Babylon, as they head off to these, uh, these foreigners in a pagan land. They're away from their temple worship. They can't do any of that. And they realize that they've been so far from the true religion that they feel God has abandoned them. And yet God renews his commitment to them by expressing his redemptive plan to them, reminding them of the plan. He says in verse four, you shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called my delight is in her and your land married for the Lord delights in you and the land shall be married. Now, again, God's dealing with Israel that way, or with Judah particularly that way. But he's speaking to you <laughs> through that. The church, his people, the covenant people who by faith have put their trust in Christ for their deliverance. He says to those who have been perhaps not as faithful as they would like to be, who have, yes, trusted in the living God, and yet other aspects of the world just get so involved in their lives that they kind of mix those together. And when they read God's word, sometimes they see how far they've fallen short. I keep saying they. I'm talking about you. <laughs> you maybe read God's word and you say, see how far I fall from where God's standard is. How could God love me? How could God show me kindness? How could he... Think of me as anything but having left him. Maybe I'm forsaken of the Lord. Maybe I'm not his people. And he reminds you this morning that he has set his love on his bride. And he calls you who have been forsaken in that sense, his delight. It's a remarkable expression of tenderness and kindness to a people who are undeserving of it. God's people in all ages repeatedly experience the same kind of things that you do. Anxiety, because they're not sure about where they stand. Uh, the inner torment of sin in their lives. They say, I, I, have, I know that I am not worthy of God's mercies. Perhaps God has abandoned me. Perhaps he has said, I'm tired of this one. Perhaps they taste the consequence of their sin a little bit. Maybe they've had some punishment that God allows to happen, and maybe some of his discipline, and they, 
fear that he has severed the relationship with you. They fear that he has forsaken. Well, you have, you fear that he has forsaken you, that he now looks upon you with disdain or with disappointment. You fear maybe that he has divorced you. But God, through his word, communicates this morning his tenderness to you, his care for you. He says, in Christ and because of my unfailing covenant with you, you will no longer be called by the name forsaken. Verse 12, they shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you shall be called sought out, a city not forsaken. Then we move to the second half of the verse in verse four to see the truth that many Christians really struggle with, struggle to believe this. I don't know if you struggle with this or not. And that is that the church has a bridegroom who is delighted in her. Okay, here we go. God is delighted in you as a child of God. Do you believe God is delighted with you? That's that second half of the declaration that we're not now forsaken. Instead, we hear our bridegroom say, my delight is in you. And that's what I mean when I say some people really struggle with that, to believe it. It's sometimes difficult to believe that God can be delighted with us when we are less than what the bride should be, when we've fallen short of him. It's not that our God is pleased with everything we're doing necessarily, regardless as to its adherence to the transgressions that he has set out or hit to the, uh, his law. But what doesn't change in that situation is, is God's disposition or his outlook toward his bride. Think of that in marriage. When a woman first marries a man, she receives a new name. And that name is now not suddenly forfeited when she does something that displeases the husband. And our bridegroom has bestowed on us a new name. It is our name. We are children of God. We are the saints. We are the ones who he delights in. That's the name we have been given. (laughs) We carry that name. It's not just Christian, but we are Christians who God delights in because of Christ. That name doesn't change. The reality is God only sees his bride as she is covered in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. If you were charismatic people this morning, you would raise your hand and say, amen, <laughs> right? That's, that's good news. It's good news. Her sins have been atoned for. No, not her. Yours have been atoned for once and for all. And therefore, his disposition towards you is consistent. It's unwavering. He delights in you. That's remarkable grace. Now, you're probably like me. I, I think this way, too. Paul was thinking this way, and he said, should we keep on sinning then that grace might abound? Since I've already got that name, I'll never change. But then he answers his own question because he knows in his heart, as you do, you can't do that. You can't just keep on sinning because you know that grace has been shown to you like that. He says, may it never be. How can one who has died to sin continue to live in it? 1 John 3, 6 says, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. So that's helpful in a description of these things, right? It's that simple. If you keep on sinning like that, if you if you kind of take advantage of that grace and you think, well, he's just going to forgive me anyway, I'll go ahead and sin, you don't even know him. You don't know the, bride, the bridegroom if, if that's the kind of treatment you're giving him. The bride doesn't try to take advantage of the groom because of his grace. Verse 5, as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. You know that at the beginning of each of our worship services, we have a a call to worship. And that's one we chose this morning, touches on that. We always begin that, that way, a call from our groom to come and adore him and worship him. And most naturally, those often come from the book of Psalms, a book which is meant to bring praise and honor to God, right? A book that regularly calls us to worship him. And one of those is Psalm 149 that we looked at. And it says this again. Let me read it to you again. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of the godly. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. 
Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and with lyre. Well, why? Why all that exuberant treatment of this other one? Well, the next verse tells us, for the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. And the second half of that phrase, he adorns them with salvation, explains how he can delight in them. Right? How could he how could he take pleasure in us who are sometimes walking off the path that we should be walking on? It's because he adorns them with his salvation. It's because of what happens in John 19. He has done a saving work by granting Jesus Christ, who suffered and died for us, his righteousness. He has granted that to us, and he also has granted his Holy Spirit to zealously assure that we are beautified, we are transformed, so that we become more and more like Christ. And as people see that transformation happening in your life, then they give praise to God. Let me move on to the next statement about what that we see in the bride here, <clears throat> uh, about the bride in this passage, namely that she's called to fervent prayer. Now that may seem like it's not following, you know, logical structure there, but he mentioned it here on purpose. Specifically, we're called in verses six and seven to pray for the very things that he promises to us that he is zealous to do as a bridegroom. What has he promised? He's going to beautify you. He's going to sanctify you. He's going to bring glory through the nations because of your, your beautification. And he's zealous to do that. Remember, by his might and zeal, they will become a means of bringing him praise and glory. Verses 6 and 7. You who put the Lord in remembrance, that is those who know him, those who are bringing their, their groom in the marriage to mind, take no rest. He's saying this to you. Take no rest and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it a praise in the earth. The picture is that the bride is to keep requesting of the groom that he will do what he says he will do. The bride is the church. The church is called to pray. Now, in a passage that has such remarkable statements of the promises of God, that he is going to do this. Uh, his strength is going to work it out. Uh, he is the one who will do this. Why is the bride called to pray? Indeed, the question is, if God has promised all of this and his promises never fail, then why are we called to give God no rest about this? Uh, some of you may know the name Derek Thomas. He's a great uh, writer in the States, a really godly man. He, he says something I like a lot. He says, some blessings are like ripe fruit in the autumn time. They're ready for the picking. But other blessings require the tree to be shaken violently. <laughs> I like that picture. You know, there's that, there's that beautiful piece of fruit right at the top that has to, you just got to grab the trunk and just shake the tree. And prayer is like that. Yeah, you can. there are some things that you could say, thank you, God. I just appreciate you giving me this and giving me that and giving me that. But there are other things God calls us to pray for and shake the tree and say, God, give me that fruit. The kind of prayer by which we beseech God to bring about what he has promised, that's a necessary part of your life as a Christian. And remember that remarkable statement that we had in James that we've referred to several times before. We don't have because we don't ask. That's something that churches always need to be reminded of. We need to shake the tree. If we wonder why we don't see the power of the Holy Spirit at work to convert the nations, if we wonder why we don't see the church advancing from strength to strength, as Psalm 84 says it will, if we wonder why we don't see victory upon victory in the process of sanctification in our own lives, is that something we should blame God for or the people of God for who have failed to seek him for those fruits on their knees? Yes, you probably do pray, and I do too. But we don't often pray in the way that perhaps we should, such a way that understands that without what I'm doing right now and asking God for these things, God is not going to give what he's promised. 
because the means to the end is prayer. He calls his church to accomplish this by prayer. For there are some things in which God has ordained that the only way in which people will receive them is through prayer. So we have to shake the tree. Thomas Brooks wrote, he that would gain victory over God in a private prayer must strain every string of the heart. He must, in beseeching God, besiege him, and so get the better of him, as it were. He, he must be the like the importunate beggars that will not be put off by frowns or silence or sad answers. They that would be masters of their requests must, like the importunate wit widow, press God so far as to put him to an holy blush, as I may say, with reverence. They must, with an holy impudence, as Basil speaks, Make God ashamed that he cannot look at us in the face if he should deny the importunity of our souls. <laughs> it's kind of strong language. I don't know if I go all the way with that. But the idea is, let's be seek, seek our God and seek uh, answers from him. And here's the beauty of it. God says, I will answer those prayers. If you seek me, you will find me. Prayer of that kind is promised an answer by an oath in this passage of verse 8. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by his mighty arm. So we need to pray as a church. Pray fervently. Uh, you may have different translations you look at in different portions of Scripture. One of those that I memorized long years ago in the King James uh, is James, uh, James chapter 5, verse 16, that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. No, we don't use the word availeth much anymore. What does that mean? It accomplishes much. It really accomplishes things. Prayer can bring things about by God's grace. Fervent prayer gets work done in the kingdom. So if the bride of Christ, who receives so much from the groom, that's you, by the way, you and I, as we are the church, if we hope to see the zeal of the groom bringing about real transformation in our hearts <laughs> to bring to the glory of God. If we hope to see the church shining beautifully in his hand, a royal diadem in his hand before the world, if we hope to see praise and honor and glory given to Jesus in the world, then we need to pray that it'll be done. So again, I just ask you, what are your prayers like? I know my prayers sometimes are so piddly at the surface level. You know, God, give us a blessed day today. Thank you for your mercies on my family. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. Am I saying, God, you promised that you would do this in my life. Will you do it today? Would you change me? Would you take the word that I read here and make it real in my life? Would you do that? Because you said you would. God, you promised. That kind of shaking the tree. Would you shake the tree with that? That's what we need to do. That's what we, uh, we, don't, ask, we don't have because we don't ask. And now there's one more thing that we see in the passage asserted about the bride of Christ, namely that she is to prepare for his coming. Those fervently praying for his promises to come about are anxious to see him come. They're called watchmen. They're looking for something. And that something is that those prayers will be answered, that his kingdom would come, that his will will be done on the earth. I think we're such a we're part of such a small little church that sometimes we think God's not going to do what he says he's going to do, which is to see the kingdom expand so that the tree is so large that other nations are building their nests in the tree, that it covers the sand on the seashore, that there is such a blessing of the of the power of God in the world, you know. So it's hard to, to pray that way, but we ought to watch. We ought to keep watching, looking for that thing that we pray for, that his kingdom will come, and that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. These praying watchmen don't simply sit there and pray, though. I was at the synod meetings of the PCEA this week, and they recognized in their uh, analysis of their current condition as a denomination that five of their pastors are going to retire and step down in the coming five years, I think it is. And they don't have anyone as a student studying theology to come up and fill the hole. And so they, they rightly said, we need to shake the tree that the Lord will provide what we don't have. But you know, if they just sat on their chairs and prayed, nothing would happen because God calls watchmen to be 
active in, in taking steps to bring those things that God promises will happen about. Same thing is true for us in evangelism, right? We say God's going to bring in the nations. He's going to bring in his elect. But I can tell you that it won't happen as we sit on our chairs. It happens as we are faithful to go share the gospel with people. It's as we go out and we're faithful to do that. So that's what he's calling us to do this morning is to not just pray, be fervent in our prayers, absolutely dependent upon his power to do it. But we've got to be actively about the work that he's calling us to do. And that's something that you see in the scripture all over, right? The parable of the talents tells us the same thing. It teaches us that we're to be busy about the work, waiting for the master to return. Now, marriage is a cooperative arrangement so that what one spouse does, the other one can be said to be doing. One represents the other. For example, if, if uh, in our household, if only I or Susan came to a particular meeting while the other was staying home with the kids or something of that nature, and the one in the meeting commits something for, the, for our family to be doing, she's committed me as well, and we're going to do what, what has been committed there. We understand that the whole McCracken family is committed to what was said by one of those. Well, if that's the way it is there, if the other party is agreeing to it, we're, we're jumping right in with it. So similarly, Christ acts in and through the church, his church. He brings about his promises as they are doing some of the labor. Yes, he will come. He will bring about a complete fulfillment of all that he has promised. But we have to see that he's currently fulfilling his promises as we are praying and laboring on behalf of his kingdom. He is building his church. His kingdom is coming because we are part of that. So in verses 10 and 11, the church is called to action. It's called under the power of its covenant head to do what it could not do before. Gates that were shut before are now being opened by his Holy Spirit. And we go through them and then invite others to come and follow. We're clear. We clear the way. We take away the obstacles insofar as we are able to do that with people. To help other people enter the kingdom. And we're to pave a smooth way for the elect to do that. So if I can summarize this, and again, I, I have it typed in my sermon notes here, my sermon outline, in terms of the church should do this, the bride should do this. But I'm speaking to you, okay? Let me, let me change the wording. I want you to rest in the confidence of your zealous Savior. This is a great comfort to us, that our Savior who died for us, loves us enough, and he says, I will beautify you. Secondly, you should rest secure in the new name you've been given and seek to be consistent to that name. Third, you should rest in his finished work to make her a beautiful, make you a beautiful and acceptable bride for himself, one in which he takes delight. As you struggle maybe throughout the week and you see some sin in your life and you say, that. Here it is again. What a discouraging thing. Yes, it is discouraging, except for the fact that you know your Savior loves you. And he's working salvation and beautification in you. So when you see that sin, you repent of it and you say, God, have mercy on me. And you know what that is? That's sanctification. That is sanctification. And then you should not just be resting about your uh, laurels, but pray. Be watchful and fervent, knowing that this is something among the chief ordained means by which God will fulfill his promises among you. And then finally, you should be active about his work, preparing the way for his coming. Well, as we continue in the Gospel of John to hear next week of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, I want you to remember your groom who has done all these promises and is then being faithful to you to work that out. And then let's us respond to the love of Christ in faithfulness as well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, how we thank you for the love which you have initiated. We love only because you first loved us, but we see that love so powerful and so faithful and so consistent, so sure, Lord, you are transforming us, even though it seems to us a slow process sometimes. We thank you that you are committed to that process, to the glory of your own name. We pray that, Father, you will reveal to us ways in which we can change and transform, and then that you will work uh, us to be a malleable people or willing to change and, and see some of that uh, taking place. Lord, bless us in our prayer life. 
enable us to uh, honestly be seeking you and your promises to see these come about and that you will help us not simply pray, but also to be faithful in our actions as well. Give us real possibilities, real opportunities to uh, be engaging with other people, particularly who need to hear the gospel. We ask this now for your name's honor and glory among the nations. Amen.